name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, as we continue our Easter season journey, and as we're on the eve of Ascension Thursday tomorrow, uh, we pray for that spirit of joy to be a part of our daily life of faith. Help us to have the courage to be a witness in the way these early Christians did under persecution, under uh, in the face of great challenges. Help us to uh, draw closer to you and to one another as we continue to try to cooperate with the grace of the Holy Spirit to form this one body of Christ. And bless all of us who are gathered here reflecting on this gospel of the Holy Spirit as we meditate on the story of the early church. Together we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. If I could ask someone in the kitchen just to close the kitchen door, I think it would keep some of the sound of the dishwasher out. Then try to start each session with a little recap because repetition is the mother of all learning. So let me, uh, each time I recap, I'll do it in a little faster pace. But uh, if you're if you're kind of the person who's sort of forming the storyboard in your head, see if you can think along with me. Chapter one in Acts of the Apostles contains a few significant events. First of all, the ascension of Jesus to heaven. Luke's second telling of this event. We talked about the theological significance of that. And then they were told to go back to the upper room to prepare for the paraclete. But they didn't just sit on their haunches. They actually took care of some administrative issues too. And in that first chapter, they decided to replace Judas Iscariot. That's the first chapter. The skeletal bones you should see on that are, for instance, first of all, already papal authority is starting to show itself. Peter steps forward and he makes all this happen. Um, apostolic succession, uh, as I mentioned at daily mass this morning, this is one of the great mechanisms that Jesus gave us so that the church can be there in the long haul. He didn't fill us in on when he would be coming back, but by establishing that custom in place of people after they passed on or left the ministry or whatever, church always has ministers in place. And um, then in the second chapter, we have the accounting of Pentecost. And we also get to hear Peter's first big preaching. Then in the third chapter, uh, and I, as I mentioned, keep in mind this spans about 30 years, so think of about a chapter a year. We don't know quite how long uh, Time passed before this first big miracle, but uh, Peter and John are present at this first big miraculous healing of the lame man in the temple. And that leads to a second preaching by St. Peter. And the church, at every moment that the Holy Spirit's at work, the church just multiplies tenfold. And so more people come um, to know the faith. But as a result of that, in chapter 4, they're placed under arrest. And they face trial, and this is the first of many times they continue to be arrested over and over again. And uh, ultimately, they're able to go back to their community and report the success. So these are some of the basic bones, the, the line. Even if you can't remember the exact chapters, you can kind of remember the flow. You could say, if you heard it in Mass, the, the healing of the the lame man, well, I know that comes after Pentecost, and I know it's before something, something, and you've been located a little bit easier. So, wherever you are on the ladder, as I say, just try to go one more step up. But, really, I hope you're also picking up, I'm trying to point out as I can, connections to our modern day, because uh, a lot of times I think we read these stories of strange happenings, and People dismiss it in their mind to say that's really supernatural, that's very amazing, but it's not like the church I experienced today. Well, it makes a differ. Um, I tried to, to bring up a, a 
couple of key points phrased is, one of them, uh, I pointed out uh, the behavior of the Sadducees. The Sadducees uh, can't win a debate, and so their strategy is to try and silence the apostles. They say, stop saying that, stop preaching in that name. And they keep arresting them and telling them to be quiet. And uh, we'll see again today, Peter gives the same answer in court in the next trial as well. Um, he says, is it better uh, for me to follow man or to follow God? You, you be the judge, but as for me, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. Uh, we are living in a time, you're, you're naive or blind if you don't notice it, we're in a time where especially the leftist elements in our culture want to silence traditional conservative values, Judeo-Christian values, if you will. It's happening on social media, it's happening in the public forum. Um, it's happened recently with, what, what were they calling it? The Ministry of Disinformation, which is a horrifying idea to me. It sounds like Cold War Soviet Union, the idea that some pointed board of the government would decide what is truth and what is not truth um, in a very arbitrary fashion, very politically motivated. That's happening. Um, if you've not experienced it, it might be because people don't know you're Christian or you haven't taken a stance. But as soon as you do, and as soon as you get a crowd of following like the apostles did, guess what? Some heat's coming your way. That's an example. Another, another I think, connection to our modern times is watch the way Peter and the other apostles show great courage. They basically say, you can keep arresting me all you want, but I'm compelled to do this. I can't stop. And uh, right now it's a small minority of people in our country, but there are people who are, we, we sometimes call them white martyrs. They're not losing their life in our country, but sometimes they're losing their career. They're losing their businesses. They are, uh, they're experiencing some heavy costs to take a stance on their faith. Um, sometimes collectively, we have this experience of persecution as you see across the country, Planned Parenthood and other entities trying to see if they can put pressure on the Supreme Court to change their plan to overturn Roe versus the way, other things like that. It's happening in our time. Um, to me, the most important Part about that detail is we say God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if you look at timid, shy Peter before denying even knowing Jesus three times, and now he's saying, You can whip me, you can arrest me, you can kill me, you can't stop me. That's the Holy Spirit that moved him from point A to point B. That same Holy Spirit is available to us, and as St. Paul points out to Timothy in his letter, the Holy Spirit is not a timid spirit. We need people courage in that regard. Um, I also think uh, where we left off last time, it gives an image of the community as a whole that's very spirit-filled. I, I just want to add this one comment. So it's a very charismatic church. You see they're led by the Spirit, they're driven by the Spirit, they seems like they're pushed by the Spirit in some sense, but it's not just, first of all, it's not just the Apostles. Because when we finished off last time at the end of chapter 4, um, when Peter goes back to the community, if I read from verse 23 in chapter 4, it says, When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they, meaning the community, not the apostles, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made heaven and the earth, the seas and everything in them, by the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples imagine vain things? The kings of the earth set themselves in array, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointing. They're quoting from Scripture and they are giving a prophetic statement. Their the reference there is the fact that the Roman politicians joining with the Jewish politicians would be only natural enemies, but so that they could kill Jesus. Uh, and they see uh, in Christ's passion the fulfillment of prophecy, but the Holy Spirit is speaking through them. So the church is not a clerical church. Everybody is a prophet, if you will. Everybody has a role. But to that I would just add one very careful thing because we still have charismatic prayers today. Uh, I've heard it nicely said at a 
this theological symposium I attended at Mount Angel. Um, the church, this is, this is how this theologian put it, maybe it'll help you to think about it. The church is both Peter and Paul. In Paul, we have that charismatic fellow. He's very spontaneous. Uh, he's blocked from going here. He's led to go there. And in everything, he seems to be linked to the Holy Spirit in what he does. And the church needs that. We need that creative response to the needs of the world. But ultimately, that submits to Peter, the hierarchical part of the church. If you, according to St. John Paul II, if the charismatic movement of the church does not submit itself to the magisterium, you have anarchy, you have chaos. So, so both go together, they keep each other in check. If you only have a clerical, hierarchical institution with no spirit, you have a dead, bureaucratic, dry, governmental organization. It's, it's terrible. Um, it's just red tape and power structures. But if you have only spiritual people, then you, you don't have unity, you have anarchy, or chaos. Uh, so the structure of the church keeps uh, the people united. And the charismatic folks within the church keep the spirit of the church alive, making sure that we are still responding to God's call. Does that make sense? So. Uh, and, and what we will come to today now in chapter 5 is another example of faithful discipline, church discipline uh, in this case. But just to recap one quick thing, let me, let me read from verse 31 and to the end of 4 so that we have a transition into this chapter 5. It says, And when they had prayed, meaning the whole community, and by the way, how are, they, how are they living their life again? There are four pillars. The regular breaking of the bread, which is the Eucharist. The teachings of the apostles, which is sacred tradition and sacred scripture, what we have today, handed down from the apostles. Prayer and fellowship, community life. That's, that's essentially the activities of the church. But it says, and when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. Like, when you envision a kind of earthquake, there's so much power of the Holy Spirit in the building is moving. Um, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God with boldness. Think about that. Everyone's bold. There are no shy people. There are no weekend Christians. Everyone is all in. And by the way, how are they all in? Um, I described to you something that actually an insight that came to me just while I was teaching. They're all in, in that when they come to this community, they sell everything they own, their land, and they give it over to the apostles, which is totally shocking because Jewish people would never sell their land. Their land represented their covenant with God. That was their goal. This was the land given to them by God, by tribe, and by family. Uh, and I gave as a, a contrasting image the story of King Ahab who wanted Naboth's vineyard because it was closer to his balcony and he liked the view of it. And Naboth said, I'd rather die than sell the heritage of my family. I wouldn't do it. So King Ahab burned. Naboth yeah, represents, I think, how a, how a faithful Jew of that time would view their land. It's like, this is not a real estate deal. We don't flip properties you know, like we see in America. This is... This is my covenant with the Lord and it represents my faith that I'm a member of the, the chosen people. But now they're selling it. It's more than just liquidating assets and it's more than just a real estate deal. What they're saying ultimately occurred to me is, okay, that old covenant, it's done. It's been in my family for, what, 20 generations? I'm going to let it go. I'm all in on this new Christian covenant. That's huge. And by the way, what's the application of that to our modern time? According to surveys I've read in Oregon, the two largest groups of people who list that they are Catholic on paper and who say, and who can name a faith community they're a part of, the largest group says they attend Mass once a month. The second largest group, twice a month. 
That's not all in. That's, uh, God is my uh, therapist. If I'm, if I'm having a bad week, I better check in. But if I'm having a good week, I don't need God. That's not the early church. They are all in. Um, and now we can go on to read from verse 32. Now the company of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Total utopian image here. And no one said that any of the things which he possessed was his own. But they had everything in common. And with great power the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Great power and great grace. There was not any one meeting among them. For as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made to each as any had need. It's beautiful. I only see snippets of this in the modern world, but when I do, I feel really overwhelmed with pride. The closest I've seen here in my time in Antwerp was the Almeida Fire. I told our special sample that we had, you know, some communities were affected by fires all over the state of Oregon, you may recall, but we had over 1,500 people in our parish who were homeless, who lost their residences. Uh, that's not a thing you prepare for in seminary. It's just like, this is devastating uh, on this scale. So many people need everything, and it was amazing. Not only our community, but faith communities in Manford and just other communities, philanthropists, people of goodwill, who came forward to share what they had. That's a beautiful picture of what the church could be and should be. Um, but that's what, that was their ordinary way of being. And, and this is when they filled in, you could just say, an introductory line of one of the key figures of Acts of the Apostles, a man named Barnabas. It says, thus Joseph, who was surnamed by the apostle Barnabas, which means a son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold the field which belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. He's all in. By the way, note here, actually I just don't see right now for the first time, the apostles changed his name. You know that whole theme about change of name. It speaks of vocation when Abraham became Abraham, when um, Jacob became Israel, when um, Sarai becomes Sarah, etc., etc., where Simon becomes Peter, and now Joseph becomes Barnabas, who will be a great co worker alongside St. Paul. Up to chapter 4, any burning question that we, we missed or comment or thought that's occurred to you that somebody wants to squeeze in before we go to life? This kind of communal living yes. is not necessarily meant to be a model for the world at large. Yeah. I mean, are we my impression is the church is very much against socialism, and yet it is for charity. Right. And okay. When you have to carry, okay. I'm sorry. I'll let you again, answer. What you have is everybody by law contributes, and on the other hand, you have people do it of their own free will. So one is coerced, and one is voluntary. Right. And I don't disagree with that. Uh, a couple things to say about that. First of all, um, our church evolves. It has changed according to what's happening in the world. Um, and so uh, it, it would be a great fallacy to say we have to stay freeze brain the way we were in a certain century because the world has changed. We have to respond to what's going on in the world. Uh, there is a difference, however, between Christian communal living and socialism. Socialism is based, you know, Karl Marx and all that, it's based on atheism. So when you see socialism taking off in America, which it is right now, um, they don't want 
the church to have a place in their new world order. Um, we need to be aware of that. However, just to show you that it hasn't totally gone extinct, religious life still exists in its model after this idea. I was thinking to myself, um, for those of you not familiar, when I entered religious life and Father Bonaventure did, uh, normally there's this, a period of time, you could just call it a, an engagement period, where you can enter into a community, you discern for a time, you can enter into temporary vows. Um, if you decide it's not for you, you part ways, hopefully joyfully, peacefully, that a community has helped you more clearly find God's will for you. Um, but if you decide to stay, uh, enter into solid vows, you sell everything you own, and you give it over to the community for their use. And if for any reason you had to depart from them, they have a custom called a dowry, which we normally associate with third world weddings, but the dowry actually in religious life is a sort of a parting cash gift to a departing brother or sister so that you don't end up destitute and homeless on the street. You know, in Father Bonaventure's case, somebody gave him a car so he could drive out here he's gradually learning how to pay taxes and <laughs> first world problems again but you know in religious life that form still exists and kind of more broadly um, our response to the preferential option for the poor keep that in two documents say we should always be mindful of the poor within our global church because if one part of the body is suffering we're, we should all be suffering we need to think that way. There's an old Indian parable, um, by the way, if you, if you don't have compassion for the poor and suffering, this parable, I think, is, is wonderful. It's a, because it uses the image of the body, um, the uh, various parts of the body start complaining to the stomach in this parable. And they all say, it kind of, it kind of refers to all of the stomach. What do you do? You don't do anything for us. All you do is take. We have to work hard to, get to grow food, to harvest it. We give it to you. You just take, take, take. And so we're going to cut you off. We're not going to feed you anymore. <laughs> well, I think we know the ending to this story. <laughs> you start starving to death. The rest of the body knows it's getting weak. Um, we all eventually are pulled downward if we take a cold-hearted, harsh view of people who are in need. Eventually, that's, that's going to come our turn to be that person in need. So, anyway, that's the church. I, would, I thought about a lot about that, too, because in our, in our modern way of living, if we sold everything and gave it to the poor, we'd be out on the street, too. Um, I can understand in, right. in religious communities, but maybe that's where tithing came in and, yeah. you know, that. It's a modified position now, Ty. There's a beautiful uh, reading in Liturgy of the Hours about this. It's, it's, I wish I could tell you the author, but I'm going to loosely paraphrase. It's basically this. You married mothers uh, should not try to live like a monk. You monks should not try to live like a bishop. You bishops should not try to live like a nun. You know, each of you has a calling, and if you um, don't stay in your lane and problem tap, you could say. So it's kind of a sophisticated modern reflection that in each of our uniqueness we're each given a task, a place in the in the body. And you know, I might you, know, you might be an eye, I might be a foot. You know, we, we shouldn't be doing the same things. We have different jobs for the sake of the body. But uh, you know, if you're married, we would say your primary vocation is to your family, your spouse and children. That's like a mini church. That even too calls that the uh, uh, domestic church. It's a basic building block of the bigger church. That's your vocation. And anybody who enters married life, if you're choosing a particular love over a, a more universal love. Someone like me, in ordaining ministry or religious life, is choosing a universal love rather than a particular love. So we choose to remain single so that we might be available to more people to serve. But everybody has their own unique niche in all this anyway. It, it works when we all share what we have. Um, and, you know, 
classically, saints point out that whatever gifts you can do, material or talent-wise, or energy, strength, whatever you have, it's not for you. It's meant to be shared. And for those who are given more, more is to be expected. The bar goes up. That's not a Spider-Man quote. That's a scripture quote. For those who are more. Any other? Yes. I think that today we would be willing to sell all we have and give to the community if we believe that Jesus is coming in our lifetime. Did, did you hear that? She said, our, our motives might change if we thought Jesus was coming in our lifetime. <laughs> You're reminding me of a joke. Oh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> John the 23rd, a very humorous man, my, my guy Paul. And somebody asked him one time, you know, the world ended today, what would you do? He's coming quick, you know. And he said, look busy. <laughs> Perspective. I just had a conversation with someone yesterday who found out they had a terminal illness and it kind of came rather suddenly. And let me tell you, nothing sharpens your priorities like that kind of news. To say, I thought I had 30 years or so to get it together. I guess maybe I have one year. I need to speed up my timeline. Whatever goal of holiness I was hoping to get around to, maybe I better get around to it this year. This might be the year. I preached about that at one point, I think last year in Lent, just said, uh, I heard a suggestion from a preacher saying, try to imagine that this is your last Lent, that Jesus literally is going to come again on at Easter. How would you do your Lent differently if you knew this was going to be your last Lent? Theoretically, that's how we should live our life. Every day is a gift. I don't know if I have tomorrow. It, you know, carpe diem, see today, right? What a an amazing life and a legacy you'd be leaving if, if we had that level of priority about our choices for each day. It's good to think about. Anyway, that brings us here to Ananias and Sapphira. <laughs> it's a sad tale, almost comedic though. For some reason, it feels like a like Shakespeare comedy scene. I don't know why they're like. Um, but I'm going to read it to you. It's not the, Nothing particular necessarily uh, important about Ananias and Sapphira, except for, you know, sometimes God uses harsh examples to get a point across. The closest analogy I can get to this is the Ark of the Covenant. If you recall, the Ark was pure and, uh, you know, made in a particular way with acacia wood and pure gold. And um, the, the, the Levite acolytes were to carry it on rods so that they would not touch it. And at one point we're told in the Old Testament, they, they, guys carried the ark, they stumbled, and they were afraid they were going to dump the ark on the ground. And one of the servants stuck out his hand to steady the ark. And what happened to him? He dropped dead. Um, that is... I suppose God had, maybe that was that guy's vocation. <laughs> okay, my, your purpose is you're going to teach the world a lesson that will be told for generations. But something about the awe and reverence in the presence of God, and also the ark became a type of Mary. No man touched her, ever virgin. Uh, within the ark is carried the word of God, and the bread of life, and the rod of Mary. And in her pregnancy, there's Jesus. He's all of those things. He's high priest. He's the bread from heaven. He's the word made flesh. Um, so, I don't have answers to all those mysterious things, but I would say Sephira and Ananias are kind of in that ballpark in this story here. How important it is to share what you have. Anyway, but a man named Ananias and his wife Sephira sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge, he kept back some of the proceeds and brought me apart and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit to keep back part of the proceeds of the land? 
while it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? How is it that you contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and died. And great fear came upon all who heard of it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out of there. It's kind of quite fearful. <laughs> After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. Uh, but Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to tempt the spirit of the Lord? This is the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and died. When the young men came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. A couple of things to comment on. When we, when we see the, the word great fear, we're not talking about terror, being terrified, although maybe there's some of that too. It's the awesome reverence uh, that we must take very seriously not to offend God here. Uh, my vigilance is amped up to maximum. Uh, that could be God calling. <laughs> you just been recorded on Facebook twice. <laughs> So, first of all, it's, it's kind of a sense of reverence that we should not be casual for God. And to, we got to admit to ourselves, sometimes we are. Sometimes we take God's mercy for granted. Sometimes we say, eh, it's no big deal. God's mercy, he understand. I'm, I'm only human. That's a kind of an excuse of, so I'm, I have permission to screw up. Um, but, but I don't think that's the original calling. It's for us to be saints. In fact, God's commandment is be perfect as I am perfect. Be holy as I am holy. It's not do your best. And if you come close, that's fine. I got you covered. But he does have us covered, but that's not what he says. Well, we need to take that aspiration seriously, first of all. Secondly, notice part of what Peter does is adversity. He questions the wife to see if she's in on it. And she lied, too, because he knew how much the property was sold for. And she persisted in the same lie her husband gave. So he, and he came to understand they were in it together. Um, so they both died. Does that mean you're going to hell? I don't think so. Uh, I think, as I say, it's one of those mysterious cases where God and his providence decided this is the time to teach you all an important lesson. My truth. Um, but I do want to clear up one thing. Sometimes I, I've heard this said in certain Christian circles, just to let you know this is different from our understanding. I've heard some preachers say, ah, here's the example of the sin against the Holy Spirit. You may know there's a passage that says all sin can be forgiven except the sin against the Holy Spirit. And what well, is this it? They lied to the Holy Spirit, and so they're damned. No. We always start with, what does whatever I'm going to say, say about God when we are doing theology? Uh, we don't want to say something that in effect turns God into a monster. God is love. We start there. You know, it's very clear in Scripture. God is merciful. God is love. God is compassionate. Um, Jesus said, I didn't, I didn't come to bring judgment. I came to bring life. I came to heal. I came that you might no joy and no to the full. He, he says all these positive things. When we have bad outcomes, it's not because we have a gotcha God. It's because we're pushing him out of our life, who is the source of all goodness and blessing, and we're turning towards Satan, toward the enemy. That's why bad stuff happens, ultimately. Um, but we, the catechism speaks of the sin against the Holy Spirit. The sin against the Holy Spirit is the final obstinate refusal to respond to God's perpetual invitation 
He's constantly saying, come to me, come to me, come to me. And if I go to my deathbed saying, no, I do not want God in my life, that's the sin against the Holy Spirit. And it cannot be forgiven. Why? Not because there's a problem with God saying God's omnipotent. It can't be forgiven because the requirement of forgiveness is that we ask for forgiveness. And that we receive it freely. So a person who obstinately goes to their death, not wanting God in their life, not wanting God's blessing, that's the sin against the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is constantly trying to lead us to God, to repentance, to, ex you know, if we use a Protestant formulation, to accept Jesus as the Lord and Savior. That, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. Um, so, questions about this couple? I was struck by the fact that Peter said you lied to the Holy Spirit. Yes, you lied to the Holy Spirit. Because, as he pointed out, it was your property, you could have sold it or not. And when you sold it, you could have kept the money or not. But when you came to the community, we have a rule, which is give all your proceeds, whatever you have, over to the community for the benefit of the community. You could call it a standard for becoming a member. And they, well, I would argue they also lied to the community. But in effect, I guess he's doing it as this is my gift to you, God. I give everything. I'm all in. And I want to be a part of this new couple. So Peter interprets it as really ultimately a lie to God because you didn't fully get to it. You're holding something back. This, is, uh, this has a lot of implications in our modern times. Uh, just in general, for those who view our Christian faith as plan B, like, I'm going to rely on myself, but if that doesn't work out, I've got fire insurance. <laughs> or someone who says, I will make the right decision, trust me, but I'm just not ready yet, because I know all those passages that say the world will hate you because they first hated me. And I, I don't want to be hated, but I, maybe when I hit 75, I'll be ready to be hated. <laughs> It's also, I mean, it also reflects those little compromises we make in our faith. And I'm not a super fan of this phrase, but you know the phrase cafeteria cafe. is somebody who goes to the buffet line and says, like, that one, take two doses of that, take three hundred to that, and I want the Brussels sprouts so much, so I'm not taking those. But we're talking about the faith of the church handed down to the apostles. If you say, I take 98% of what the church has to offer, but this other 2%, nah, I am, I'll be the judge myself. You know what? I had a professor point out to me in seminary, how many rejections like that does it take before you have no faith? One. If you say, I'll take 98%, but I don't agree with this 2%, that's not faith anymore. That's just the church has a teaching. I have my own teaching, basically. I have my own opinion. Therefore, you basically established a new church, population one. You're the Pope of your new church. But it's not the church of the apostles. So we use the phrase, holy obedience of faith. Obedience of faith means it would be nice if I understood all the teachings, but I don't start with understanding. I start with faith, seeking understanding. I offer, the, just to give a kind of an obvious example, I tell people often in RCIA, if, if I told God, I'll get around to joining you if I can, when I understand the Trinity, the mystery of the Trinity. Well, I'll never get there. I try by analogy to make some connections, but there are certain things about the teachings I just don't understand. And there are certain things that we just see in the world. Why is there suffering in the world? Why is there evil in the world? Why doesn't God take action and stop this or that thing? We all wrestle with some of those things. But the default position needs to be faith. Seeking understanding. And I do my best in my lifetime to be a lifelong learner and try to get it. But if I fall short, I'm going to be like Peter and I'm going to say, where else am I supposed to go? You have the words of everlasting life. I don't have a, 
another place to turn to. So I'm staying right here. Does that make sense? Now, the, with that, let's move to verse 12, if we can. This is a big contrast between, let's say, chapter 3, when Peter and John, through the power of God, performed their first great miracle. Uh, you, you're, here, you're, you're hearing a different kind of reality here, what they become elevated to. Re, uh, listen to this, or read along if you have a Bible with you. Now many signs and wonders were done among the people by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them. But the people held them in high honor. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord. Multitudes, both of men and women. So that they even carried out the sick into the street and laid them on beds and pallets that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits. And they were all healed. Wow. Now, miracles are happening, and theoretically, Peter's not even aware of them. I heard a beautiful evangelical preaching, like 20 years ago. I, I, I just have kept this in my head. This guy, he referred to this uh, scene as shadow ministry. Uh, he said, it's kind of a beautiful image. I want somebody to do a painting of this, to be honest with you. Where it just sees the apostles back and silhouette. In order for the you to be walking along and your shadow falling on somebody, it means likely that you're walking toward the sun. And your shadow is being cast at your back. Um, and he pointed out that this is a reality actually in ministry. Where if we walk toward the sun, S O N, if that's our sole focus. Sometimes, just through our intimate relationship with the Lord, people take notice of it. People are edified and are moved by it. Um, people are led to faith by what we're doing, and we don't even know. And we won't know until we get to heaven. Can you imagine how beautiful it would be if you lived such a life, and you get to heaven, and there's these hundreds or thousands of people standing around, and you turn to God and say, who are all these people? I don't, think I, know, I don't think I've ever met them. And you're told, these are people who came to faith because of your example. When you weren't noticing, when you weren't paying attention, your shadow affected them. Wow! That would be awesome. But even more crazy is this last phrase, all were healed. There's only one other place I can think of where you see that kind of dynamic phrasing. That is the Gospel of Mark, when it talks about Jesus' early ministry in Capernaum, where it says every person is brought to him, and they were all healed, every single person healed. This is the power of the Spirit working early in the church. Uh, but now, you know, the apostles sound superhuman now. They don't sound like any of us. Um, and what's the power of God but ultimately, the awe is so great that we're told that uh, none of the rest dared to join them. I shared, I think last week, with some of you, when we think of that word again, catecheo, catechesis, catechism is the word echo. The image that comes to me from Scripture that sounds a lot like that is Moses. Moses regularly heard the voice of God, but there was loud thunder and lightning and trumpets and everything. And the people came and said, we're scared to death. We don't want to hear this stuff anymore. Why don't you just be our spokesman? You go do it. We'll, we'll watch back from a safe distance. And later on, when he comes down from Mount Sinai, uh, and he regularly goes to the beating tent to speak to God as though face to face, as though to a friend, um, the people stay in their tent, they kind of duck away and they watch him from a distance. 
And we're told that his hair turned white and his face glowed brightly like a light so that ultimately he had to cover his face with a veil for apparently for a few moments after each encounter with God, he looked physically different and the people were kind of terrified of him and they kept a distance. Like he's, there's a grand canyon between me and Moses and then there's a bigger grand canyon between Moses and God. But he's way out there from the rest of us. This is now the apostle, it seems to me. They, they're setting up shop in this Solomon's portico in this shaded area. And the other faithful, although the building is shaking and rocking when they're praying, and they're praying in the spirit, they are just in awe to not approach too closely, like it's holy ground. That's uh, kind of a mind-blowing image to reflect on there a little bit. Anybody have a reaction to that passage? I equated this with, in modern times, sometimes when the saints have died, uh, around their tomb or something like this, healings and other things have occurred. I just read recently that people are making pilgrimages to Saint Charbel's tomb because a lot of healings are taking place. And so I equated that with this, that the holiness of the God coming through these saints is healing people. Yeah, we, in every century, this mind, what, if you read the lives of the saints, I had a, there was a priest I knew. He made a New Year's resolution. He was going to read a hundred biographies of saints. He came from the business world. He reasoned, well, I used to, when I was a businessman, I used to read books about CEOs and their keys to success, how to become a millionaire, and these are the things I do, and this is my morning routine, and here's how I organize my time and my information, and here's how I network and all these kind of things. And he said, if I put in that kind of time to become a millionaire, how much more important should it be to figure out how to become a saint? So he decided, oh, well, I can't network with the saints in an ordinary way, but I can read about their lives. And his theory was, there's probably things, even though they came from different walks of life, there's probably things they had in common. And if I just study very diligently, I will find the keys. And uh, I, I ran into him when he finished his 100 books, which is a pretty good accomplishment if any of you have ever tried to set a goal to get a hundred or anything. And we asked him, you know, well, what did you discover? And he said, uh, I decided to read a thousand. <laughs> <laughs> it kept him going, but in fact, he was joking aside, there, there are some common things, but what you do notice, which is pretty powerful in a time when people want science, is there were great supernatural events that happened around these, in every generation. I mean, you know, in our own recent time, St. Padre Pio, for instance, the extraordinary mystic, unexplainable stuff. Um, but you can see, I mean, part of it, part of what I think when I read this is, how far short am I from my true potential? I must be a bit of scum on the floor. I mean, uh, I'm definitely not what I could be, uh, and if I could dare to sacrifice a little more and give a little more, I'm just it's a reminder uh, what God could do through us if we just surrendered. I had a very profound moment in seminary. I, I had a lot of anxieties early on. If I went through all the details, I'd say, "What a basket case!" This <laughs> but one day in particular, I remember really distinctly thinking about this concept of surrender, dying to yourself. It, it, it frightened me because I had a misunderstanding of what it was. I, I said to myself, if I keep decreasing and you keep increasing, it's straight math here, at a certain point I'm going to disappear. <laughs> I'm going to decrease down to zero and poof, I will, you know, self-annihilation is what I was thinking. So I actually went to a counselor, a Christian counselor, thankfully. And he, in an instant, what a deep wisdom he had. He was a safety man. He said, you're thinking about this all along. What is decreasing is your thought of who you are. Uh, and when it starts to diminish, you become more and more the king 
thinks Samson, God thinks you are. And you, you are not self-annihilating. You are actually becoming who you were intended to be. You are starting more and more to reach your potential. So it tells me a lot of what we think we are is a lie, actually. It's, it's uh, artificial or it's kind of a shadowy truth. Uh, when you see the great saints, how transformed they are, uh, it gives you a little bit of a hint to what that might be like. Okay, any other comment there? In this particular section, uh, we focus on the, the power of the apostles and so on. But the other side of this is the faith of the people that were healed. Yes. Because Faith is not knowing. The faith is believing in what you don't know. Yes, that's a that's a scriptural definition. Believing in what you do not, cannot see. However, it was pointed out actually by, by BJ a couple of weeks ago with the healing of the lame man. There's no way that lame man had faith in the name of Jesus. He was at best a marginalized Jew. He could have been. Foreigner, for all I know, there's no detail about that, but there's no way his faith was enough for his healing. And so the question became, whose faith was enough? By because he pointed out, by faith in the name, by faith in Jesus Christ, it's Peter and John, mm -hmm. and that led us to talking about the stretcher bearers who bring their friend and dump to the ceiling of Peter's house and. Jesus, when he healed them, said it's because of the faith of your friends, these stretcher bearers that I'm healing this guy. So think about that as we ponder holes in our roof. <laughs> you always think of you know, the uh, life team quote about if you go to work for Jesus, prepare to have holes put in your roof. <laughs> Gerald? Um, I just, when you were talking about the chasm of understanding that was between us and God, and that just makes me think about how much more amazing and how much more we see the picture of God desiring to be close to us when we see that he stooped down to become one of us in blood and flesh and sweat and tears from his infinite like, distance from us. He wants to be so close to us through Jesus. I think it's so beautiful. Yeah. That's profound, what he said. And sometimes it's, I think it's a thing we take too lightly. When the Creator, this is a theological word, which is when He condescended to come down, He descended to us, with us, just like the New Jerusalem descended toward Earth. He came down, someone who's infinitely greater than us, to be with us. It's part of the reason why it's the greatest miracle God ever did. It's not a light thing. Uh, in the words of St. Thomas Aquinas, we have more in common with the rock than we have with God. <laughs> Even though we're the image and likeness of God, we're a finite creation, and a rock is a finite creation, whereas God is something much bigger, infinitely great. We will spend eternity pondering that. It's crazy. Um, but, yeah, we need, you can do some Lexio to me, you know, just on a scene like this and say, I'm going to spend a whole hour thinking about that. It just fills me with awe and reverence and joy. Um, and it makes me think, where can I, I need to grow. I need to reach my potential a little bit better. Um, use each day a little bit better. And you know, count the blessings. You know, thank you. Um, so let's move on to verse 17. <clears throat> Predictably, what happens here? They're arrested again. <laughs> Um, it says the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is the party of the Sadducees, filled with jealousy. Now we see a snapshot of their heart. Before they were mad because the apostles were preaching about the resurrection, which the Sadducees did not believe in. But now clearly there's something else too. They're jealous because the crowds are following them and not the Sadducees. It's about a claim, a bit. And they arrested the apostles and put them in a common prison. So, it seems like not too many days passed, but back in a prime van again. But at night, the angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go 
and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And what this life being Christianity, this new covenant. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and taught. Now the high priest came, and those who were with him, and called together the council and all the senate of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came, they did not find them in the prison, and they returned and reported. By the way, two things to note in case there's confusion. When we talk about guards here, we're not talking about Roman guards. This is the temple police department. They're Jews. But still, the punishment for losing a prisoner, death. Kind of, you wouldn't like <laughs> look forward to reporting that you messed up your only job uh, and the prisoners are gone. Um, and they, they report, we found the prison securely locked and the sentry standing at the doors, but when we opened it, we found no one inside. Now when the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these words, they were much perplexed about them, wondering what this would come to. And someone came and told them, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. <laughs> then the captain and the officers went and brought them, but without violence, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. This is the second time there's a mention. The guards don't do anything aggressive because they know we're likely going to get killed if we if we treat these people roughly. They can tell the whole crowd is with the apostles. Um, but, you know, the great prison break, you imagine someone's going to skip down or at least go into hiding. They're literally like 50 yards away, right where they were arrested, and they're back at it again. And ultimately, just to skip ahead, we... We hear Peter give a similar answer when in question. The first time in chapter 4, he said, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. It's kind of a double negative when he's saying, well, We're not going to change what we're doing. Now he says again, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him on his right hand as the leader and the savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. And so he's basically saying, same bad time, same bad channel tomorrow. You want to uh, look for us? We'll be right there again. <laughs> Not going anywhere. And as I say, how aggravating with your Sadducee because Solomon's portico is basically the front porch of the temple. They're just, they're right at the front door, and they're preaching this other religion. You know, it'd be, it would be like if someone of another religious faith parked in front of the front doors of our church. It would be aggravating if someone doing a big tent or driver right in front of our church. That's what they're dealing with on some level. I have empathy for them. But... You know, they can't explain where the miracles, and now the miracles are, there are too many to count. And by the thousands each day, people are coming to this faith. Uh, from verse 33, it says, uh, when they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee of the council, named Galileo, a teacher of the law, held in honor by all the people, stood up and ordered the men to be put outside for a while. The Scamaliel, we learn later, is the teacher of St. Paul. That's his fame. Um, but basically, they're having a conundrum. They tell all the people, you guys leave the room, we need to chat here. Um, and he said to them, once the room was clear, the apostles going out in the lobby and waiting, men of Israel, take care what you do with these men. For before these days, Theodos arose, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him, but he was slain, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean arose in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He also perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, 
Keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of men, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. That's a deep, deep wisdom. The church uses this today. It's part of the idea of take time, pause, and observe. By their fruit, you will know them. Human invention, it can't sustain itself. Satan is the father of lies. He's a great copycat, but we know from the history of the church and exorcism and stuff that he can't maintain a lie forever. If you wait long enough, you will see the lie on display. And if, I mean, imagine, there are people today who say, these guys, they really punked you all. It's just a bunch of mental, mentally ill people. Really? They all died martyrs. That's a, that's a pretty good practical joke. You take it to that extreme of suffering, to be scourged and arrested and scourged and arrested and put to death, to just to punk us. <laughs> I don't believe that. And here we are 2,000 years later. We are here despite every effort to destroy us from outside and from within. Every persecution from outside, every scandal from within. I have this wonderful book I, I recommend. I'm still only halfway through it. I cut it years ago, but still it's worthwhile. It's called Hostile Witnesses. Kind of based on the idea of our legal court system. When you call a witness, maybe initially you thought it was going to be a witness for your side, but they changed their story or they, um, they're talking back at you and then you turn to the judge and you see legal drama. Judge, I'd like permission to treat this witness as a hostile witness. Meaning they kind of turn the coat. Um, every story of the little snippets, like two or three page snippets of tyrants and despots and people who, who claim their plan was to eradicate Christianity from the world. And nobody remembers their name anymore. These dictators, they all turned to dust and here we still are. I call that proof of divine origin. If we were an invention of man, we wouldn't be here 2,000 years later. We're still here. Um, so that's a wisdom the church uses. You know, I always think of Gamaliel as a prophet. Because yeah, he was in that case. I would say the Holy Spirit was speaking through him, even though he's a Jew. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's how I always think of him. Sure. And the Holy Spirit did speak through Jewish prophets. So, in this, uh, by the way, it points out, though, even Caiaphas. You know, Caiaphas at one point in closed session, we gotta we gotta believe that Nicodemus or um, Joseph of Arimathea, one of these must have been the eyewitness because it was just a Sanhedrin meeting, closed session. But Caiaphas said, "It's better that one should die rather than all." You remember that line? He said he said at some point he kind of showed his true color. You know, I don't care if he's innocent at the end of the day. If this keeps going, the Romans are going to send their army, their legions. We'll all lose our independence and what little power we have, we're going to lose that too. So let's just kill this guy. It's better to sacrifice one for the, the sake of saving all. And scripture comments in that, in that he acted or he spoke in a prophetic way. That Jesus did die for the salvation of all. Even though, now there's a hostile witness. Guy was, was not on board, but the Spirit still spoke through. Which, by the way, a little twist, yes, in our, in our papal history, you can point to scandalous popes. Think of them like Caiaphas. Uh, popes are, we would say, infallible only when speaking on faith and morals. Most of these, the more scandalous popes, they didn't pronounce on anything. They didn't do it. They didn't do their job. Um, so, there's no error introduced. Um, but at times, God works through them anyway, right? It's straight with crooked lines, so it's crazy. But I want to comment too on these two guys, Theodos and Judas the Galilee. Theodos, uh, well, if you think of the Zealot party in the time of Jesus, the, the more historic inspiration of that, if you will, from several, two or three centuries before, would be the Maccabees, which is a story that you can find in the Catholic Old Testament, but not in the King James Bible. It's part of 
um, the Old Testament we adopted that was used in the diaspora anyway. First and second, the Maccabees. The Maccabees were a Jewish family who rose in, uh, started a brass rich revolt to kick the Greeks out of their land because the Greeks were trying to wipe out Judaism. They were, they were trying to pull up Adolf Hitler and just wipe out the faith. So these guys in righteousness rose up and had a holy war and ultimately they were victorious. It's where we get the Feast of Hanukkah. Uh, the temple was uh, splattered with pig's blood and a big statue of Zeus was put in and it was, it was defiled. And after their victory they came cleansed the temple, they took all that stuff out there, re it, they broke up the altar, built a new altar, rededicated it for holy use. Um, that's what Hanukkah is. Um, a festival of light. But apart from the Maccabees, who were an inspiration to the Zealot State Body, if they could do it with the Greeks, we could do it with the Romans. The only difference is, do we have enough faith? Like they had enough faith, God will be with us, we'll win. Uh, but a more recent inspiration for the Zealot movement was this Thales. He rose up trying to start a civil war, a revolution. But before he got going too far, he was captured and executed in 44 AD. So like one generation before Jesus. This guy, Judas the Galilean, he's actually mentioned in a history, a Jewish history of Josephus. He was arrested and killed by Herod the Great. Um, he was a bit of a, I think a bit more like Geronimo. He lived, he kind of used the national borders as a way of hiding. They lived in cliffs, in caves. They would come down and raid for food and steal stuff. But ultimately their goal was to um, topple the government at that time too. They also kind of envisioned themselves as zealous. It's why even in Jesus' time, Galilee has this reputation of Criminals. When they think or said, can anything good come from Nazareth? Um, he's talking about that whole area that it's known for criminals like the Wild Wild West, Billy the Kid, and Jesse James, and all these guys. Um, well, Herod, how he rose to power, how he became king there, even. He grew up in Rome. He, he went to school with Augustus Caesar. You know, they studied under great philosophers, so he had ties in Rome. He said, what would you do for me if I could eradicate all these criminals? And they, they made him king. So he, on his own expense, with his own army, he chased them down. And it's very similar if you know the story of Masada. He got them treated like a raccoon. You know, they were in their caves. They couldn't get out. So they decided, we're going to starve you out. We'll be down here every time someone pokes their head out and kill you. And ultimately, they committed mass suicide. That's what happened to this um, Judas the Galilean. And um, this fellow is suggesting that these apostles are just like that. They're just trying to start another movement. They'll self-destruct on their own. We don't need to do anything. But if they're being led by God as they keep saying they are, do you want to get in a fight with God? You're not going to win that. That's not very wise. So... That is uh, the advice, and, and that's this from verse 40 where we're in. So they took his advice, at least that day, and when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and at home, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. They were joyful that they were counted worthy to suffer. That's supernatural or it's twisted. It's either mental illness or it's supernatural. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, that's a rare person. I met uh, I met a guy in the Marine Corps. He became a religious brother that I lived with. And he was very pious. He had very uncompromising principles. And when he was in the Marine Corps, they would sing these kind of songs for their exercise. He thought they were scandalous and he wouldn't sing them for religious reasons. So they just kept giving him push-ups. More and more and more push-ups. as punishment. Then he started making everybody do push-ups to see if everybody else could put pressure on him. 
And he said at one point after a few days of this, he started laughing and smiling. And he, and he said, I, I started saying to myself, am I being persecuted? Wow. <laughs> That's exciting. I must be doing something right. My faith is strong enough to be persecuted, to be targeted, and I'm withstanding it. I guess that's, that's the apostles in that moment. Uh, something to think about as we stop there. Comment? Question? Well, I, I do have a question, Father. Yeah. I was thinking about this the last couple of days, and it kind of ties in, sort of, kind of, um, with, with Peter saying, we must obey God rather than men. And I'm sure you've heard about uh, Archbishop Cordelo, Cordelo, She can receive communion back in Washington, D.C. Yeah. Sadly, the bishops are not yeah. united. It's a scandal. That's scandalous. Because, yeah, you know, we must obey God. And so exactly. Well, I stand for him. The Archbishop of San Francisco is correct. Um, by the way, he's like, that's all. Walter like, <laughs> <laughs> Wing Cox or Ted Bay of Christ. But, yeah, it's, it's a sad thing. But I guess I would leave you with this meditation. It's a fair question to take to prayer. Have I ever been persecuted in my life for my faith? If you have, that means someone knows you to have been devoutly living your faith. They know you as a Christian. You've taken a stance. Now you've been targeted. I mean, a lot of us, I think, could say we might have experienced it as a community. But have I ever experienced it individually? And if not, why? Because it's a promise Jesus made. The world will be. So, if you're not associated with Christ enough to be seen as connected with Him, that's probably not going to happen. But it could, it could happen within your family. And I just have to Thanksgiving holiday. <laughs> doesn't necessarily have to be a stranger from the street. <laughs>
persecution and marginalization. Uh, we lift up to you those parts of the body of Christ and other parts of the world who are suffering more deeply than we are. Sustain them with your grace and uh, the goodwill of the people of faith everywhere. Help us in our journey to gain courage through your grace to, to be more bold and grace-filled in the way we live our faith and the way we give our testimony and the way we're willing to share it with other people. We pray all these things through Christ our Lord. Amen. May Almighty God bless you all. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 See you next time. Amen.